The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Good morning, everyone. This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tommy O'Brien. Uh, I'll be with you guys until Monday of next week. Give me one second. Let me switch my headphones here. Good deal. If, you know, it's Thursday, but it really feels like a Friday. But, you know, that just, we're not going to let it drag on. It'll be good. Let's see what we're taking a look at today. Uh, we'll go a little bit slower this morning. Um, just until we get into the market open. We have the uh, ES Mini, turning about sideways right now, 45.17. The SPY is on an ABC up, price trajectory of about, excuse me, tra trajectory of about 4.62. Uh, Russell's up about 18.04, 90 cents. The NQs at 15,864. The Dow trading right there at 35,000, pre-market now. Gold contract at 1976. I've been kind of experiencing a slight pullback here throughout November, uh, but now we're back up, especially with the dollar uh, going down and breaking the 104 level uh, for a little bit. I think we got down to 103, about 70s. We're back trading uh, to about 104.17. Uh, but the idea is this isn't really going to hold price, so we'll see how that moves down. We're looking at a $99 uh, kind of target for the DXY. That would send equities and obviously the metal market up pretty high. Silver has been doing all right, trading about 2% right now pre-market. Um, really got some action in it, trading probably about 21.92, somewhere around here, and then really just took off all the way up to the $24 area. We have copper trading up 0.36% at $3.73 on the contract. This one's pretty big, so we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, but light speed crude futures uh, trading about 75.88 right now. Um, the U.S. is refilling its uh, SRP right now, which is massive at these lower levels. I think they're buying at about $77. Uh, and then let's see, the IMF sees kind of a demand and supply imbalance going forward, where uh, demand, excuse me, supply will just be so much higher due to kind of uh, progress in extraction and uh, storage. So we'll take a little bit more of a deep dive into that later in the show. Let's take a look. What else? We have Tesla at 239, STLD closing at 111.26. Um, so that kind of broke its general trend. We were trading in 100 to 110. Um, obviously, you had some peaks a little bit above it, but those kind of like a magnet got pulled right back down. We had a break down at that 100 level, went all the way down to about 95.60. Uh, this leg down was on some pretty significant volume uh, for the day. Uh, but we came right back up. And again, you know, what, what worries me with this is you don't have as much volume, you don't have as much energy going up into the higher bounds of the channel, which is the 110. You really broke through it, which is pretty stellar, up to 114, about 28. But again, on no volume comparing to these major breakdowns past the 100 level. To me, that kind of says that, you know, it, it wants to go a little bit lower, um, but... As it stands now, you know, we're trading at 111.26 um, and still getting some bounces uh, when we have a pullback on it. So, uh, you know, if you're looking to trade this stock, uh, just keep that in mind. It does look like it wants lower prices, but when that's going to happen, obviously, uh, you know, we don't have a crystal ball here, but we can kind of look at what the stock's doing and make some general um, projections going forward. The QQQ at 385.18, Google at 137.22, Meta 331, Disney. Oops. Disney Fine. Oh, man. This is like music to your ears, depending on what your, your price point is. Um, this is positive for the company, at least for right now. You have some massive volume gapping up there. Uh, we're trading about 93.89 currently. Uh, Apple at 189.10 and the SPY at 449.60. We can take a look at Target quickly. We do have Kevin Hinks on the. Uh, Next segment, so it'll be nice going forward here. This is huge volume on the gap up, which is nice. Target was getting hit a little bit. Their major competitor 
uh, going in right now was Walmart. Walmart was offering um, cheaper prices for all their goods, even their groceries as well. Uh, Target was not able to compete as well with Walmart. However, their shares uh, jumped obviously more than 17%. You can see this massive gap up. Uh, they posted big earnings. Um, the sales did fall. So let's take a look here. The target on Wednesday topped Wall Street's quarterly sales expectations and blew past earnings estimates as purchases in high-frequency categories like food and beauty helped prop up weaker consumer spending. Shares of the company closed nearly 18% higher Wednesday after the news, partially a reflection of the stock's drop so far this year. The big box retailers stared uh, down the same challenges that it has faced over the past few years. Shoppers aren't buying much more than the necessities. They're hungry for lower prices. And when they do make purchases, they're postponing them. Of course, everyone's been kind of tight, and U.S. consumers have been relying on credit and their savings uh, in order just to survive. This was a, actually a pretty nuts situation. I, uh, with a friend I had, I hadn't spoken to in a while, um, you know, she's just like a normal U.S. worker, um, you know, worked in um, hospitality, all these kind of things. And uh, I ran into her uh, the other day, and she was telling me that things are so rough right now. She's out in Tampa. Things are so rough right now um, that her and a lot of her friends that she knows are digging into their retirement savings that they have. I mean, these are young people, too. I, you know, I'm 27, so people around that age a little bit older. Uh, and then really using credit just to, to buy food and to live. Um, it's pretty intense. This is why Walmart, in my opinion, uh, well, partly contributed to them just kind of skyrocketing value-wise and sales-wise because they were offering cheaper um, groceries, really. I, I, this should alleviate a little more going forward than the rest of the year. Uh, but still, you can see that a lot of people are hurting from it. For the second quarter, Target's comparable sales declined. The industry metric, also called same-store sales, takes out the impact of store openings, closures, and re renovations. So these are just the things that you can kind of count on going forward um, and are not dependent, again, on kind of uh, unique occurrences for that quarter. Uh, the CFO said on a call with reporters uh, that it's laser-focused on moving traffic and sales back into positive territory, of course. Um, Target's leadership cautioned that won't happen this year, even as holiday shoppers hit stores and websites for decorations and more. The earnings per share was 210 versus the 148 expected, which is pretty solid. Revenue was 25.4 billion versus 25.24 billion, as expected. The sales have slowed across the retail industries. Consumers feel a budget crunch from elevated prices, of course. Um, Target did have actually pretty decent home goods and impulse uh, purchases as well. But I think what's happening is you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a larger contraction here because now you're seeing you know, I would say in the middle of this year, probably around like March to May, uh, you're getting the consumer economy being propped up mainly by wealthier uh, people. So like, you know, upper middle class uh, to upper class. You know, they were still buying luxury goods. We saw that with Hermes. We saw that with Burberry. In fact, Burberry in UK has at least seen a pullback in um, consumer spending. So now you're getting the component of the consumers that were actually still spending on luxury goods. They're pulling back now too. So we might see... Um, you know, kind of a, yeah, essentially like just a general crunch in consumer spending. Uh, in the fiscal third quarter, Target's total revenue fell uh, from $26.52 billion in the years prior. Comparable sales dropped 5%. Digital sales declined at 6%. Folks, stay tuned. Uh, we should have Kevin Hinks on next. We'll be right back with you. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years 
years' experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no cash or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. Um, we're taking a look here right now at the Light Street Crude Oil Futures, trading at 75.26. Uh, the U.S. is planning to refill 1.2 million barrels of oil for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, the department said the planned purchase for oil is at an average price of 77.57 a barrel from two companies after 18 bids were submitted. The administration last year conducted the largest ever sale from the SPR of 180 million barrels, part of a strategy to stabilize soaring oil markets and combat high pump prices in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, if the purchase is finalized, we'll have bought back about 6 million barrels as oil prices have risen on production cutbacks by Saudi Arabia and Russia. It has been difficult for the administration to buy back oil for the reserve. And honestly, Russia is still selling. I, I think they had uh, the world had imposed a cap of about 60 bucks on Russian oil, which is uh, not a good break even. I, well, I think it's just above break even for Russia. Um, but they've been able to skirt that. We spoke a little bit a few months ago about how these kind of like shadow economies run. Uh, so, you know, even with like Venezuela, right, they had, we've historically had an embargo on Venezuelan oil as a way to kind of punish uh, their regime over there. Uh, but that still gets out. It, now, it does sell cheaper, but it still is profitable for these countries. And Russia is doing essentially the same thing. Um, what will be interesting to see with Venezuela is they're, they're saying essentially that they're going to have democratic elections on the next cycle, right? Um, I think Maduro's president right now, um, they're seeking to change that. If that's the case, the U.S. has promised to lift uh, the embargo on Venezuelan oil. That would obviously flood the economy with supply, excuse me, the market with supply as well, uh, in a time that supply is already increasing. Um, and so that would be actually pretty positive for oil prices. And I think um, we could actually see then, if you look at like a geopolitical perspective, this would actually hit Russia to some extent. Um, last month, it was raised, uh, excuse me, it raised the price at which it hopes to buy back oil to 79 or less a barrel, up from an earlier price range of about 68 to 72, so still buying higher for the SPR. Uh, last month, the Energy Department said it hopes to buy 3 million barrels for December delivery and another 3 million for January at the higher price. It said it expects to issue additional oil purchase solicitations for the reserve on a monthly basis through at least May 2024. So we can take a look, too, um, over here. So this is from, it's from Bloomberg. It's posted on World Oil, but... 
The global oil markets won't be as tight as expected this quarter as upward revisions to demand are outpaced by upgrades to supplies. And this is from the IEA. It boosted forecasts for the world fuel consumption this year and surprising strength in China and still anticipates a supply shortfall during the fourth quarter. But it'll be roughly 30 percent smaller than the previously projected. Uh, and that's about 900,000 barrels per day shortage. Um, this is a quote now. The world oil demand continues to exceed expectations. Uh, yet world oil supply growth is also exceeding expectations. Production growth in the U.S. and Brazil have been outperforming forecasts. And, and you know, it's hard because there is a lot of you know, obviously, there's a lot of oil in the world, right? Um, but what it comes down to is when you have these larger institutions, like we can look at Russia, right? They, they, want, they need oil to be at a certain price so that they can be profitable. This was a big issue during the Trump administration um, with the kind of the OPEC plus, uh, yeah, I say war, but like conflict that was going on. Um, and what was occurring is the U.S. and Saudi Arabia were producing at a higher rate um, which was driving the price down. Now, Saudi Arabia and U.S. could produce at profit at these levels. Russia couldn't, right? So, you know, there's a lot going on. I know Jared Kushner kind of mediated that argument, especially with Mexico as well in the deal, which is part of OPEC+. Plus. Um, and so, you know, you look at adding more people to the mix, right, in Venezuela, and I look at Nigeria as well, and Niger. They have large amounts of oil. I, I know the Omo Delta... Um, has one of the largest reserves of uh, light Swede crude. Um, that process over there that they do to extract it is, is uh, it's pretty bad, essentially, right? One, the government doesn't do anything right regarding getting this oil out of the ground. So what essentially happens is you get pirates who come in and they start mining or drilling for oil. This oil just floods the entire natural region. You guys should look this up. I, I can maybe post a documentary uh, in the den. Um, but but this this process is is insane. So they're just they're you know tapping the oil reserve. It shoots up everywhere. It fills the ground. They essentially direct it into these large steel vats, and they burn it off. It, it's a very very rudimentary way of of processing crude oil. And they get diesel. The diesel is very unclean. Uh, it can damage vehicles. But um, still, there's a large swath of the population that just needs any kind of access to fuel. Um, and so they can run this kind of diesel. Yeah, it destroys the environment. Uh, furthermore, there's a lot of use in like folk medicine uh, for consuming oil. So that is a big economy down by the Omo Delta. And it's sad because you would like to see the rest of the world kind of get together and be like, all right, let's prop these guys up. Uh, let's push oil out. Let's make it cheaper for everyone. But that's not really the goal. It's, it's keeping within the bounds uh, that it makes uh, financial sense. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, the macroeconomic uh, sentiment is deteriorating. There's a lot of concern about interest and in slowing growth. This is the head of the IEA's oil market division. Uh, oil demand is holding up strongly and exceeding expectations, especially China going from strength to strength. I haven't heard much about um, any kind of energy, you know, at least regarding natural gas going into the winter in Europe. Um, but we'll see. It, it, it's hard to believe it's already been a year. I mean, we were having this conversation a year ago about energy prices skyrocketing um, because it's cold in Europe and parts of the U.S. So we'll see what kind of develops out of that. As it is now, again, the light Swede crude oil futures are trading about $75. Let me see here. We're talking about Target a little bit. This is actually an interesting blast from the past. Uh, let's see if I can pull it. I'm more of a Dillard's guy if I ever go to these kind of places. But Macy's has done pretty well. We're up 11.9%. Uh, this crushed estimates, essentially, for the quarterly profit as a department store operator margins benefited from better inventory management and lower freight costs, sending its shares up about 8% pre-market. Uh, the company became the latest U.S. retailer to signal improved margins from efforts to bring down inventory from 2022 highs. Uh, obviously, this is in contrast uh, to Target, or not in contrast, but just along with Target, essentially, that blew, uh, blew up. Pretty significantly, we we're just talking about them. They had a 14% reduction in inventories and a forecast uh, forecasted a strong holiday quarterly earning report. Macy's is saying that we're entering a holiday period and healthy inventory position. Of course, uh, merchandise inventories at Bloomingdale parents were down 6% year over year and down 17% compared to 2019. The retailer is seeing strength in its beauty and off price offerings, which is helping to offset weakness in other discretionary, uh, discretionary categories. The thing is, I do. 
like if you go to some of the, the, the malls are essentially are consolidating, right? We have in St. Petersburg, there's Tyrone Mall, right? This mall is essentially dead and they're trying to figure out ways to get people to come in. But like it, in my opinion, it's just not really going to happen. But you still have malls that are popular, right? Over in Tampa, you have International Mall and then you have West Shore, right? And these are pretty populated constantly. But everyone from around the area is kind of making, you know, the trip to this place. I think that the in-store retailers foreclose still have staying power. And, and it's mainly, now I, I, I do know people who still buy, let's say, uh, I know like a lot of my friends who are uh, women, they buy from online. I guess they know their sizes. As a guy, you know, a medium or a large is different from other medium and larges. I need to go into the store and I, I see that happening with a lot of other guys as well. Um, so I think getting in and trying on the clothes, trying on the shoes, let's say, uh, is still very relevant. And I think we'll uh, see that stay the case to come. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30 plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you ready to take your trading to the next level? Introducing Tom O'Brien's award-winning newsletter, Market Insights, your key to successful active trading. Tom O'Brien, renowned for his expertise in the financial markets, has designed Market Insights to be your daily guide to profitable trades. Tom publishes his daily Market Insights newsletter every market day before the market open, along with updates when warranted. Stay ahead of the game with Tom's real-time analysis and trade recommendations delivered straight to your inbox. Whether you're a seasoned trader or just starting out, Market Insights provides the edge you need to navigate the markets with confidence. Ready to join the ranks of successful traders? Head over to TFNN.com and subscribe to Market Insights today. Don't miss out on this opportunity to supercharge your trading results. Market Insights comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee for all new subscribers, so you have nothing to risk. Don't miss out on this opportunity to revolutionize your trading game. Head over to TFNN.com right now to join the thousands of traders who have already experienced the power of Tom O'Brien's award-winning newsletter, Market Insights, firsthand. TFNN, educating investors. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. <clears throat> Welcome back, folks. This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tommy O'Brien. I'll be with you tomorrow and Monday as well. Let's take a look. Uh, so, yeah, I talk about digital currencies. I talk about cryptocurrency sometimes. Uh, not so much the price movements with crypto, but more just about what's going on fundamentally with them. So I do think it's interesting to look at. Now, this isn't necessarily a cryptocurrency, okay? This is a digital currency. These are different. Still looking at Macy's on this chart. I'm going to move something on over here. Now, this is going to tie into some 
new uh, investing opportunities that are coming around, but let's just talk in this realm of digital currencies. Um, the IMF says that central bank digital currencies can replace cash. This is a quote. Uh, this is not the time to turn back, okay? I don't know, it's, it's their opinion. Central bank digital currencies have the potential to replace cash, but adoption could take time. Uh, I personally think, listen, we'll get into this a little bit. I, I think this is going to be um, not accepted, at least like in America, right? Like we already have a lot of our cash digital and everything like that. Um, there's a large like contingency in America that really distrusts this move. Um, I think probably Europe, this will be like an easier thing to sell to people. So, I don't know. The movement away from that, um, I think what this, it, it, like, let's look at it like in a positive way, right? Just like not moralizing it, but just kind of like seeing what could come from it. Obviously, this eases um, kind of trade across uh, boundaries, across borders, essentially, right? Uh, makes it cheaper because you don't have to print out a bunch of money. Um, so, I, I do see that there is like a major move going towards digital currencies in the future. That's something you don't like. You know, there's always, um, you know, physical gold. There's uh, cigarettes. I don't know. Whatever you can barter, I guess. Um, let's. <laughs> this is the quote essentially from the IMF fund managing director. It said, CBDCs can replace cash, which is costly to distribute in island economies. Okay, right. So the Singapore FinTech Festival. Uh, they can offer resilience in more advanced economies, and they can improve financial inclusion where few hold bank accounts. Yeah, the distribute in island economies, I I'm sure probably that was just to kind of pander to the Singaporean audience. But the point is really what this does, and you can see a general move um, by these larger economic institutions to kind of uh, essentially disintegrate a lot of the boundaries between countries. Like we look at the EU, right? This was a concept that was you know pushed probably in the 1890s, but even... Uh, popularly in the 1920s and 30s in the UK, right? And the whole concept uh, essentially was that you kind of remove the barriers to entry to other economies. You kind of merge these things together, these economies together. The scale gets much higher. People, uh, as material benefits um, essentially rise uh, with other uh, wealthier countries in the fold there. I think that's called the Fisher effect in economics. Uh, so this has been something that, you know, at least you can see the EU, but I think the US as well, has been moving to since uh, the early 20th century and definitely after the war as well. The CBDCs would offer a safe and low cost alternative to cash. It would also offer a bridge to go between private monies, a yardstick to measure their value, just like cash today, which we can withdraw from our banks. The IMF has said that more than 100 countries are exploring CBDCs or approximately 60% of countries in the world. The level of global interest in CBDCs is unprecedented. Several central banks have already launched pilots or even issued a CBDC. According to a 2022 survey conducted by the Bank for International Settlements, of the 86 central banks surveyed, 93% said they were exploring CBDCs, while 58% said they were likely to or may possibly issue a retail CBDC in either the short or medium term. It's pretty interesting. Something to kind of read a little bit more about and see the kind of impacts of that, the positives and the negatives. So we talk a little bit about that. Let me try to pull up what BlackRock is doing. So I know Tom talks about this a little bit. He definitely talks about GBTC, uh, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. BlackRock is creating trusts uh, for different cryptos. They, they essentially filed for one in June for Bitcoin. We spoke about that a little bit. And this one's for Ethereum. And I, looking at the fundamentals and how crypto actually kind of operates in the real world, I like Ethereum a lot more. Um, I like its proof of stake concept. I think it's a relatively stable kind of price. Um, you can build a lot of things, at least on the Ethereum blockchain. So I think that's pretty positive. <clears throat> we'll take a look. Asset management giant BlackRock on Thursday began courting public investors for an Ethereum trust, doubling down on its cryptocurrency bets amid potentially easing regulations over such vehicles. This is the iShares Ethereum trust, which was registered last week, will give investors access to Ether, the second most popular cryptocurrency without directly owning it. It's pretty decent. Now, this is what's important to know is a spot investment vehicle. And I actually like that more. I, <clears throat> you know, obviously there are plenty of like leveraged ETFs that have um, futures products tied to the fund itself. And those are great. Uh, you have really good upside, but of course you can also get hit pretty hard with it. Um, I like the spot investment vehicles. Uh, I, I think this is actually good. If you're like an Ethereum bag holder, you want this to be the case. 
Um, you're going to have Bloomberg essentially buying more of the actual asset itself. Uh, you have more people interested in it in general, right? That will, in theory, kind of um, strengthen the price floor of Ethereum. While future-based crypto funds have previously been approved by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the regulator has long contended that spot crypto market is prone to fraud and manipulation. I mean, yeah, and so is the futures products. And and you just have a way higher risk. Let's look, too, at what like the pension funds did in the U.K., right, when you had the guild crisis. Is they were supposed to be holding these 10-year guilds, and, which is, you know, in a sense, essentially like a spot concept, but uh, they sold those and then bought futures for it, right? And then they were kind of shaving the extra um, growth off it, kind of pocketing it. I, I don't know. I, I think that all regulators uh, contend different things regarding crypto, excuse me, spot and futures regarding crypto. I think that's kind of a silly thing to say on that end. But, but in August, the Federal Appeals Court ruled that the SEC was wrong to reject an application from Digital Adge Asset Management, excuse me, Asset Manager Grayscale. It's a little early, folks. I'm, that uh, brain's still turning on. Grayscale Investments to create a spot Bitcoin exchange traded fund. A landmark victory for Grayscale has prompted a wave of filing for spot investment vehicles in recent months, helping restore some faith in crypto industry that was shaken by several high-profile collapses last year. <coughs> Excuse me. BlackRock dipped its toes into the crypto space with, a, with its filing for spot Bitcoin ETF in June. Its latest filing indicates that the Wall Street behemoth is aiming to move beyond Bitcoin. Yeah, that's the point. And I, I want to say, too, like, we can talk about this in a general sense, um, I, I don't like Bitcoin because I I do believe in the concept of using cryptocurrencies as a medium of exchange. Bitcoin really isn't that. And I don't think a lot of people, especially like you're more like common folk, use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, right? This is like an appreciating asset. Um, I think too, Ethereum is a little bit different, right? Because they're using proof of stake. Now you still get huge bag holders who get a benefit from that. But if we look at how the proof of work was done, Ethereum was originally proof of work um, and Bitcoin is still proof of work. The concept is that like, you're still gonna get these large, very powerful kind of cadres who are able to really control the supply of Bitcoin, right? So they're sitting here solving hash algorithms. Once the hash algorithm is you know, completed, obviously a new one is formed and you gotta keep going on, uh, but a block is formed and there's the currency there as well. Um, I think that what you're seeing is you get these large kind of enterprises who are able to hoard a bunch of Bitcoin. This dries up the price. And depending on when it's advantageous for them, they drop the floor out from under it. They get a big profit and the little guy still gets screwed. I don't know. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFN. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the Opening Call newsletter at TFNN.com. The Opening Call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. 
The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor for Side Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. Uh, this is CRISPR Therapeutics AG. Uh, we're up trading at 56.79 right now. We are a uh, little bit past market open. Kind of missed the ball on that. Let's take a look at ES here. Trading about 45.15. The Russell trading at 17.97, down a little bit to right now, just a tad. 15,845 in the NQs. The Dow futures are 35,030. Gold trading up uh, a little bit, 1980 silver. Still in the 24 level. Then we have the copper contract trading at 372. Tesla down at 237.93. Steel Dynamics down 110. The DXY uh, moving on the way down. I think it wants to break that 104 level. If we see that today, that'd be solid. Disney up at 94.32. A little upward uh, movement for the stock, which is nice. Uh, let's take a look at CRISPR. So. All right, so the reason I'm bringing this up now, this isn't necessarily affecting this company in particular, but it's the whole industry that looks at kind of gene therapeutics. So the UK has actually approved the CRISPR gene editing therapy, which is pretty nice. It's used to treat sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. The UK has become the first country in the world to approve a therapy based on CRISPR gene editing, with the regulator authorizing a treatment for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. So, what, like, essentially what CRISPR does, right, is you have these long repeating proteins in the DNA. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to find the chain in that DNA that's, uh, I suppose, expressing something negative, right? So they're going to cut it out and replace it with one that they've made. One of the biggest hurdles for CRISPR um, technology is that somehow w within our DNA, I mean, not somehow, I mean, it makes sense, right? If there's something that's irregular, in the DNA chain um, that the rest of the kind of blueprint doesn't understand, it actually does delete it and then put back what was there prior. Uh, this has been a really big hurdle for it. And this is why people like uh, mRNA vaccines uh, more so, right? Because you can kind of tell DNA what it wants to do and everything. Um, anyways, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. CRISPR is a flexible, efficient gene editing tool based on the bacterial immune system. Uh, this was developed in 2012. I think it's pretty huge. Uh, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency has approved the therapy called Cascavy, uh, which was developed by Vertex Pharmaceuticals and CRISPR Therapeutics here. So what we're looking at, uh, the drug could be used to replace bone marrow transplants, which is huge. I think that's pretty neat. Just a little bit of uh, kind of looking at science a little bit uh, for the day as well. I do think, let me see here, if we can look at uh, Moderna. Yes, yeah, so they're up 140. Okay, they're down right now, 1.44%. Um, they've obviously been moving down because of uh, less need for the COVID vaccines, but <clears throat> they're pretty forefront in uh, developing mRNA vaccines. That will be huge for cancer as well. 
So if we can see that in the next coming years, I mean, that in a way, the thing with cancer is it's so individual, right? And so you need to tailor kind of um, these cures to the individual person. Um, mRNA can do that in theory, which is uh, would be a huge leap forward um, in medical uh, advancement. So I think that's pretty neat. We can take a look. Um, oh, I just deleted the thing. Cisco is down, um, which is sad. Let's take a look here. They're down about 13% in the extended trading on Wednesday after the networking hardware maker issued a glum forecast for the current quarter and full fiscal year. Uh, here's how the company did compared to the consensus among uh, analysts surveyed by LSEG. Earnings 1.11 per share adjusted versus 1.03 per share. The revenue 14.67 billion versus 4.61 billion. Revenue increased 7.6% in the fiscal first quarter, which ended October 28th. Uh, net income at 3.64 billion or 89 cents per share rose from 2.67 billion or 65 cents per share in the year uh, ago quarter. During the quarter, new product and order slowed down mainly because clients are busy installing and implementing products after strong delivery in three previous quarters, Cisco said in a statement. Yeah, and that's actually positive for the company. I, I think, let's look at it as well. Um, there's a certification uh, that I'm looking at. It's called CCNA, right? And this is uh, that's the IT one, not the healthcare one. And that's for implementing Cisco products and operating them. And the reason why this is so <clears throat> you know, sought after, it's a very difficult exam, um, but the reason why it's so sought after is so many large companies use Cisco products, right? I, I personally think, again, investing in the IT and even the security side is so important. Cisco uh, really is at the cutting edge of developing uh, more secure um, products as well for businesses. Um, this is a quote from the Cisco CEO. Our customers and our sales organizations have been very clear with us over the last 90 days that this is the issue. Um, the company is projecting that one or two quarters of shipped products are waiting to be implemented. So, you know, this expands out any kind of, um, you know, acquisition of new uh, hardware for people. And with respect to guidance, Cisco also called for $0.82 cents to $0.84 cents in adjusted earnings per share on $12.16 billion to $12.8 billion in the fiscal second quarter. That implies a 6.6% revenue decline. Uh, Cisco reduced its full year forecast for revenue, but bumped up its view for earnings. Okay, we're looking at that. That's great. Now, I'm going to move in a little bit to here. Uh, we're going to talk about Fortinet. Uh, because they were actually down as well. And this is because cybersecurity uh, investment, or excuse me, spending, I suppose, is kind of shrinking, right? So Fortinet sank nearly 18% and sparked a sell-off in cybersecurity stocks with dismal forecasts that compounded fears of slowing client spending in an uncertain economy. The current losses, if they hold, were set to wipe out nearly $8 billion from the company's market value, which is horrible. Uh, Palo Alto, Zscaler, and CrowdStrike fell between 0.6% and 2.6%. The Fortinet cut its annual revenue target on Thursday and said it expects current quarter sales between $1.38 billion and $1.44 billion, below estimates of $1.5 billion. We thought sentiment reflected an expectation for Miss Guy Down, but the magnitude is even worse than our bogeys. This is a Raymond James analyst. Competition in the sector has been intensifying as clients seek companies that serve as a one-stop shop for all cybersecurity needs. That is totally true. Um, you don't want to be dealing with a bunch of different processes. When when the fire starts going, you, you don't want four different companies you have to communicate with. Um, Cisco is also like that. I mean, you know, they provide, uh, you know, the entire like supply chain horizontally almost, at least for cybersecurity. I mean, you have, um, you know, general like um, analysts, right? Like people can look at the seams and stuff like that. They have all their hardware that you work with, the software that goes with that hardware. They have forensics people um, and that's, you know, big for the company. Now, I still think what's important to talk about, again, is a general slowdown on spending in cybersecurity. I talk about this all the time. How does it affect you? It affects you because your data is out there and you've given what's called PII, which is personally identifiable information, to a lot of these companies. And these companies are slicing their spending on it. I mean, we you just had one of the largest... Um, uh, excuse me, um, I can't think of the word, God. You just had one of the largest ransomware attacks on one of the Chinese banks has ever occurred, right? You've seen recently with uh, you know, Russian attacks on U.S. infrastructure with intelligence malware. Uh, you saw it with the casinos. Obviously, it was a huge issue for Target. It was a huge deal for Equifax. And these things go on all day. Um, I had a friend who lost her identity, right? Someone stole her social security number, and that was linked 
to a an information breach. And so like us as the consumers need to be really strong on this. I, you know, I mean, imagine you had a castle and you're like, well, I think we're gonna spend less on guards and there's like barbarians at the gate. I mean, this is like kind of what it is. I'm not trying to fear monger, but it's a genuine thing and I don't think people are familiar with it, right? You have to have a healthy respect for this kind of stuff in order to make the right calls. Folks, stay tuned, we'll be right back. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the US futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. All right, welcome back, folks. Uh, we only have a short kind of uh, segment here. So talk a little bit more on like cyber. Remember Clorox got hit recently by a cyber attack that messed up their supply chain and screwed the company um, for a few quarters to come. Their cyber chief is leaving. Obviously Caesars Entertainment got hit. We take a look here as well with regarding, you know, Caesars Entertainment. The FBI actually struggled to disrupt the dangerous casino hacking gang. Uh, this, this gang had been doing this for quite a while. Uh, the FBI had struggled to stop a hyper-aggressive cyber crime gang that's been tormenting corporate America over the last two years. For more than six months, the FBI has known the identities of at least a dozen members tied to the hacking group responsible for the devastating September break-ins, the casino operators MGM and Caesars Entertainment. According to four people familiar with the investigation, industry executives have told Reuters that they were baffled by an apparent lack of arrests despite many of the hackers being based in America. The president of CrowdStrike is even, I would love someone to explain it to me, such a small group, they were absolutely causing havoc. Like, yeah, you only need like five people and you can really do some damage. 
The FBI said it's investigating the gaming company hacks, but a spokesperson said uh, spokesperson for the agency declined to comment on a larger group responsible for the investigation stands. You know, I wonder, and I, I kind of muse over this a little bit too, I, I wonder if you're going to start seeing um, like insurance uh, sold to corporations for, you know, cyber hacks. Um, I think that would be pretty insane. And uh, honestly, in my opinion, I don't think that would be necessarily good because it kind of like becomes an accepted risk. Um, I think there's probably going to need to be some like legislative changes. They're going to have to take place until we feel, um, you know, it's always a cat and mouse game. And, and no matter how much you do, you're, you're going to get attacked, right? Um, and people are attacked every day. And the, the cyber team really works uh, very hard in order to prevent those people from getting in. I mean, think about like working at a bank, right? I, I had a family member um, who did cybersecurity for, uh, I can't remember the bank's name. I don't, I don't know if it's around anymore. But um, essentially, he was like, every day they're getting prodded and they're getting poked and the perimeter is getting tested constantly, right? <clears throat> So this is an ongoing thing. It's not just, it just occurs randomly in the wild, right? Um, and so, of course, like, you're always going to have this issue. Uh, but the point is, you know, we invest more in it and we get as safe as possible. Then we keep going forward and everyone's better off. Folks, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, Tom's also out. I think we might have Basil filling in, but we'll let you know a little bit later in the day. Um, I hope you guys all have a great one and uh, happy trading. I'll see you tomorrow.